section 4.2 is just the basics of probability. Um, I mentioned a good while back that there are two main kinds of or two main branches of statistics, the first being um, the branch which just takes the data and organizes it or describes it in some way. What branch of statistics was that called? No, the key word there was describes it. Descriptive. Descriptive statistics um, finds like the mean, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, the z-scores, and then graphs it in all different ways, makes frequency distributions and histograms and all that good stuff. That's the descriptive branch of statistics. And then beginning in Chapter 5, we're going to get into the inferential statistics. Okay, we have found that the um, mean IQ of our sample is 99.7. How do we use that to predict the mean IQ for the population? That's inferential statistics. Well, chapter four is the bridge between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Probability is the bridge between differential and uh, inferential. Did I say differential? Descriptive and inferential statistics. 4.2 is just the basics of probability. I think this is going to be uh, very easy and make sense to you today. But if you don't have time to do this homework until after the test, you can spend the next couple days doing that practice test as many times as you can. And then after that, make sure you get this homework done. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can think of... Um, a place where it has pre-tests and post-tests, but I can't think of where it says practice quiz. Could you hang around one jiffy after class and show me that? Because I don't want y'all doing anything that you don't need to do, anything that might mess you up. Um, there are pre-test and post-test in my math lab that I didn't create, and they may have stuff on them that y'all don't really need to worry about. So all I would do in my math lab, if I were you, was the stuff that I made up, your homework assignments, and then the practice test I put in there. But show me what you're talking about after. All right, basic concepts of probability. Um, this section presents three approaches to finding the probability of an event. Um, the most important thing in this section is learning how to interpret prob probability values. What does it mean when the weatherman says there's a 30% chance of rain? You know, how, how, does, how would that correspond to a probability statement? That's what we're going to figure out. The rare event rule for inferential statistics says if, under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is extremely small, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. I distinctly remember reading that sentence the first time I taught statistics, and I was mad anyway. You know, it, stuff doesn't make sense when you're mad at it when you read it for the first time, but I just looked at it and thought, what the heck? What is that saying? Well, if under a given assumption, let's make an assumption that um, we're betting on whether a coin lands on heads or tails, and our assumption is that we're playing with a fair coin, all right? If we are playing with a, hundred, with a fair coin and we flip it 10 times, but nine out of those ten times it lands on, oh, we're not talking about a coin. We're talking about a die here. Nine out of ten times that we roll that die, it lands on six. What does that make you think about the die? Yeah, that's that's highly unlikely. If you roll a die um, six times, you might get one six. You might get two sixes. If you roll a die ten times, you might get one six, two six, maybe three sixes. If you get nine out of ten sixes, that causes you to doubt the assumption that you made, which was that the coin was fair. So the rare event rule is a way of causing you to think, hey, maybe I need to rethink the assumption. Maybe the assumption I made is not correct. Um, some vocabulary you need to incorporate into your statistical lingo, 
An event is just any collection of results or outcomes of a procedure. Um, the event could be I'm going to roll a die. Um, I'm going to roll 10 die at the same time, just toss them out. And um, the event could be that they all land on even numbers or that they all land on odd numbers or that they're all ones. That's a lot of different events. A simple event is an event that cannot be broken further down into simpler components. If I was rolling two die, then getting a total of eight would not be a simple event because that could be a four and a four or it could be a two and a six. That rolling an eight on two die could be broken down farther into two different ways that you could roll a eight. So that in itself would not be a simple event. A sample space is all possible outcomes. The sample space for a procedure consists of all possible outcomes um, that cannot be far broken down any further. Some notation. From now on, capital P is going to be probability. When you see a capital P, we're talking about the probability of something happening. And in parentheses beside that P, you can put letter A for event A or letter B for event, event B, or you can actually put the event in parentheses. Um, if I'm talking about 10 couples having babies and I want the probability of three girls, instead of saying let event A be that out of 10 of them, three of them have girls, I'll just put probability of three girls in parentheses. And then a with a line over it is called the complement of A. It consists of all outcomes in which event A does not occur. For example, if, if A is the event that it gets above freezing today, what would the complement of A be? What's everything that's not above freezing? Below freezing or or freezing, all right? So if A is above freezing, then the complement of A would be equal to or less than freezing. Everything that's not in event A is in its complement. A and its complement together is the set of all possible things that can happen. There are three basic Rules for computing probability. Um, it's not so important that you understand the names of these three ways to find probabilities as that it is that you just understand how to find probability under a given circumstance. The first way is the relative frequency approximation of probability. For example, if you're going to roll a die 90 times and count how many times it lands on six, then the probability of landing on six would be the number of times that the die did roll on six, land on six, divided by the total number of times that you roll the die. Another way to calculate probability is the classical approach, but you can only use the classical approach when you have equally likely outcomes. Now, actually, if you're rolling a fair die, it's as likely to land on a one as it is a two or a three or a four or a five or a six. That's what it means to be a fair die. So if you have six events that are equally likely to occur, the probability of any one of them occurring is just there's only one way you can land on a six out of six possible outcomes. So the probability of landing on a six would be one out of six. Only one way you can get a six out of six different things the die could land on. The probability of getting a six is one sixth. And then the third way of finding probability is when you just have to have some knowledge about the situation. Um, and you estimate the probability based on your knowledge of the situation. When 
in, in a presidential election, would it be fair to say um, we have a Republican candidate and a Democratic candidate? So there are. Um, no, I'm not saying this like I want to. Give me just a second. We have a Republican candidate and a Democratic candidate. So the probability that our next president will be a Democrat is one out of two. It, it, does that make sense? I mean, does, do we always have a 50 percent chance of electing a Democrat and a 50 percent chance of electing a Republican in any given election? Not really. Those two events aren't equally likely. If you knew that one of those candidates was the incumbent, um, the sitting president, the sitting president always has an advantage over anyone running against him or her. So um, you would use your subjective knowledge about whether the person, one of the candidates was already president, that knowledge would affect your estimation of the probability of having whether the next president is going to be Democrat or Republican. This makes more sense with examples. Relative frequency approach, um, when trying to determine the probability that an individual car crashes in a year, we must examine past results to determine the number of cars in use in a year and the number of them that crashed. Um, My mind keeps going blank. Is that because I don't have electricity at my house? <laughs> my, my electricity up here is not working either. Um, that's the relative frequency approach because it's every car on the road doesn't have an equally likely chance of crashing, right? You got good drivers, you got bad driver, drivers, young drivers, old drivers, drunk drivers. So it's not the classical approach because not all drivers have the same chance of being in a wreck. But if you take the number of crashes and divide by the total number of cars on the road, that's the relative frequency approach. And probably this number was calculated by an insurance company wanting to know what to charge for premiums. Your premiums and in insurance are um, based on your probability of being in a wreck, and that can be determined by your age, your gender, your um, good student discount, because good students have a habit or have a history of demonstrating responsibility and carefulness, so they get cheaper insurance rates. Um, the relative frequency approach is just the number of times something was observed divided by the total not number of um, events. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm not going to want this video. I'm going to keep going because I promised I would, but it's not going as smoothly as I want it to. The classical approach when you have equally likely outcomes. Um, for example, the lottery. Unless it's rigged, every ticket is supposed to have the same chance of being a winning ticket. Now, if, if it's rigged, then all bets are off. But if the grand prize is going to be chosen by selecting six numbers between 1 and 60, and each combination has an equal chance of occurring, here's the probability of you, any one ticket, being a winner. If you have six of those little tumbling balls that the pretty lady always reaches in and pulls out a number from each one of the buckets, um, the numbers are, or the balls are numbered 1 to 60 in each one of those buckets. So I'm going to pull out one number from the first bucket, one number from the second, one from the third, one from the fourth, fifth, sixth. And, and all six of those numbers have to match in order for you to have the winning ticket. Um, that's your chance of having the winning ticket. It's lower than your chance of being struck by lightning. When trying to estimate the probability of an astronaut surviving a mission in a space shuttle, 
Experts consider past events along with changes in technologies and conditions to develop the estimate of probability. For example, um, I don't remember how many Challenger mission or how many space shuttle missions there were or which one was the Challenger which blew up. It was fairly early in the uh, shuttle program. What if um, the Challenger was the fourth shuttle sent up and it exploded midair? Would it make sense to say out of four shuttles, one of them blew up, therefore the chance of the next one blowing up is one out of four? The answer is no, but why Why does that not automatically mean that the next shuttle has a 25% chance of blowing up? They, well, you would hope so. Yeah, they, they knew what caused the Challenger to blow up, and they fixed that problem. Technology is always getting better. So just because one of the four shuttles did blow up, that doesn't mean that one out of four of all shuttles are going to blow up.